Thanks for joining us today. Before we get started, the views in this episode are the views of Phil Hahn and myself alone and do not reflect the views of AFWorks, Spaceworks, the Department of the Air Force, or any other entity except us. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Phil Hahn. Phil is the Chief Strategy Officer for AFWorks and SpaceWorks. Phil, welcome to the pod. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on, buddy. Oh, this is, uh, it, it, it's great to, uh, to be able to sit down. Uh, it is getting a little cold outside, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's great to be in here nice and warm and, uh, and have a friendly conversation. Absolutely. I'm just happy I could find time on your schedule and, uh, yeah, get out of the cold. That's, that's for sure. Uh, so yeah, I, I guess the, um, you know, it, it's, it's good to boomerang back to Pittsburgh, uh, former military, former military officer that, uh, that's back in the still city. So that was, that was a great part. Um, you know, I've been building out AFWorks now for, uh, for about three plus years. Uh, so that's been, uh, that's been a lot of fun. I was the former deputy when we, when we first started at uh, a lot of it out, um, and bringing it together. And then, uh, now the, the chief strategy officer. So just, this is probably going to make me sound like a total idiot, but just for the people listening, what is AFWorks and, and SpaceWorks? AFWorks is, uh, is the, uh, investment and innovation arm of the, uh, air and space force. So we, uh, we have three kind of mission divisions. Uh, one is a spark and that, uh, really is, uh, innovation at the grassroots level. How do we, how do we give everyone a voice, uh, to, to solve interesting problems that are out there? So that's like airmen with 3d printers, basically. Airmen. Yeah, exactly. If they need a, if they need to 3d print something versus, you know, following a long arduous process for them to pr- procure that. Um, <laughs> and it's amazing when you give, you know, when you give airmen, when you give anyone kind of the opportunity, um, and the spotlight to be able to, and the resources, right? So that's, that's what that division does, you know, giving them the resources, uh, to have their voices heard, to collaborate with each other, to, to solve those problem sets. And, and we've seen a lot of really interesting things that have come out of that division. Um, yeah, so I, the, I guess the second mission division is ventures. So ventures is the one, you know, the, 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 the vision that does all of the investment, uh, about 1.5 billion in, uh, in grants, uh, it's a SBIR and STTR program. So it's it. small business innovative research program, and small um, business tech trouts for te- technology transfer. Yeah. So that's, okay. that's that piece that, uh, um, that, that we do for the, for the air and the space force. And so that really brings a lot of it together. And you look at, um, all the investment that's going into defense tech now is, has shot up significantly over the last two years. And I, I, I think that's a lot, a lot because of the, the DIUs and the AFWorks and the Naval X's and all, all the other innovation entities that, that we kind of helped push forward in the DOD. That's really where a lot of this, I mean, you talk to any defense tech company, you know, it's almost a given that they've had an AFWorks, you know, SBIR. Yeah. Well, it's also just awesome to see somebody taking a figurative machete to like a lot of the red tape that's historically <laughs> existed. You know, it, it's just a repellent to innovation, and so to to see you know people fighting back against that and and you know making the space accessible to good ideas and good technology is is a beautiful thing. And then the the third is is Prime, and so Prime is really a uh, technology focused vertical. That, that we're looking at in the future to not just um, not just for that technology, but also what are the second and third order that we can help the industrial base. Uh, so the first one that we did was electric or electric vertical takeoff and landing, EV tolls. Um, some people call them flying cars. Uh, you know, there's there's a whole lot that's out there. We have uh, it's it's really a, a collaboration between the two entities. We we don't want to slow down. Um, we don't want to slow down the private sector. We, we want to be here to, um, to help them move faster. And so like an example for agility prime was, you know, we would, uh, provide range access. We would, we would help with the FAA. We would help with airworthiness. Um, there's some cybersecurity stuff that we almost bring them in. Like, like it's a developmental, uh, 
aircraft that, that we work, which it, it predominantly is a developmental aircraft. Uh, we actually just received the first production Joby aircraft um, oh, cool. out in uh, out at Edwards Air Force Base. But again, we're looking at how can that partnership work to where, you know, we, we find the right military utility out of it. Okay, so 1.0, like basically massive spark cell or like program of spark cells where like yeah. you're like encouraging airmen everywhere to get into making stuff. 2.0, you're bringing in agility prime and ventures, kinda, right? Kind of became a thing, yeah. Yeah, okay. So then we're, what, and then 2.5, if you will, like Spaceworks joins the fray. Yeah. So where does 3.0 come in? Really 3.0 is, is what I like to call professionalizing the process. Um, we are working alongside all of the major commands. We're working in sync with, you know, all of the, uh, the secretary comes out with these things called operational imperatives. Um, so it's making sure that we align with the, those strategic goals and some of the strategic vision that's out there. So it's really going from that tactical level to the strategic level of ensuring that we can connect the dots instead of just being this force that is, you know, jamming stuff into the air force. Um, it's, it's starting to incorporate everything better into the acquisition process of the air force, uh, which again, takes several years. So we've been, we have been doing this, but 3.0 is a more conscious effort to refine, to refine that and, and bring in these other entities, uh, from a, you know, informational and process standpoint. That's pretty cool. Um, and I mean, I guess running something like that, I've seen your schedule, like you do wear a lot of hats. I was gonna say you must, but <laughs> you do like you're, you're, you're a busy dude. Really something that, uh, that hits home with me, uh, when I look back to kind of my childhood was, I just remember my dad always was like, you know, if you're not out there, if you're not out practicing, if you're not out, you know, grinding away at something, someone else is. And when, when you meet them, they're going to beat you. So, um, <laughs> you know, I don't know if you want to call that fear or, uh, or, or great motivation, but, uh, that has kept me kind of very just active and hungry across the board throughout a lot of my life. So you were, uh, you flew, right? Like you actually got to fly planes in the air force at one point. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was a really cool, a cool time. I, uh, I know we talked a little bit about perspective too, and uh, being a flight test engineer and a mission director, um, I was a mission director before I was a flight test engineer. What's the role of a mission director? Um, if you think of, you know, like Apollo, you, you watch like Apollo 13 or whatever, the guy's like, Houston, we have a problem. Like he's in the back, you know, kind of orchestrating everything. So you're like the chief operating officer of the mission. Yeah. That, that's a good way to put it. So, yeah, I mean, so I was doing that for a lot of the developmental tests for like F-22 and, that's wild. and and stuff like that. So, yeah, we'd come up with, and, and, um, when I switched, when I switched jobs, I, I was a data link engineer. So in the control room, and then I transitioned up to test director and mission director and, and doing that, doing that type of stuff where you're leading the mission, you're doing all the briefings, you're basically the person in charge of the entire mission from, you know, even, even the, you know, let's say of the base commander that's flying in the mission, you, uh, you outrank him during that, during that mission, which is really interesting. That like, is really interesting. It's a really interesting dynamic. Um, but I can see why, because after I became a flight test engineer, I would fly in the missions and it gave me a better perspective of what they're going through in the air while I'm on the ground making sure that everything in the mission is good. Um, so we, I would fly in the back seat of an F-16 and we'd be doing whatever, you know, flying with whatever aircraft was there or doing whatever type of um, uh, ground station work or, you know, whatever it, we were doing. One of my last missions was a uh, – we were doing – training with Navy SEALs um, and uh, teaching them how to uh, basically call in airstrikes. And so, oh, wow. so yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was two o'clock in the morning <laughs> where uh, I'm, I'm sitting in the back seat. We have the night vision goggles on. Um, they're down with their lasers, like 
lasering stuff, calling in, uh, calling in airstrikes. And then we would, we had these little dumb bombs that were on it. And so we'd drop a dumb bomb and it would, it would go at the target. We're out in the middle of nowhere in Nevada. What's so. a dumb bomb? Uh, it do- doesn't explode. Oh, I got it's it. just full of concrete. So it, it goes and it impacts the target. But so it, there's like a little poof. Or something yeah, it's just a, it's just a poof. Impact. Yeah, you can. Get, get, that's all it's for. It's it's okay. They're they're giving us coordinates or they're doing that. And we're, we drop the bomb and it it goes down. That's so probably training for you guys as well, just to kind of coordinate. With uh, them. I mean, it was it was super cool for me because I'm I'm in the back. Um, the pilot knows how to do this because he's had a lot of training. Oh, got it. Okay, right. So. Like uh, I'm just kind of in the back as a test engineer, calling in different things you know, monitoring that monitoring what's going on, you know, I'm scribing stuff in the back or, um, it's gotta be somewhat nauseating to be like flying those maneuvers while you're trying to write. Oh yeah. Think clearly. (laughs) Yeah. I mean the, the best is we would do, uh, what's called BFM. It's basically where you're dog fighting. Oh, cool. So, but there's also like close range air to air or air to air missiles that you can do while you're doing the dog fighting. So think of like, you know, the new Top Gun movies and stuff like that. I um, probably should watch those. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's where, I mean, we would do that. That would be a lot of fun. And being able to do that, like I said, it, it gave you such a different perspective and I became such a better uh, mission director because of that. I, I could, I could just, I could tell, I, th- I, I thought through the mission differently i thought through the timing differently um and i could i could talk to and relate to the pilot a lot better because you have a much you know larger perspective of the mission understanding what they're going through um and you're going to get to a better outcome having that perspective what made you want to kind of go down that road and, and get into that sort of i guess lifestyle for lack of a better word i joined a, a spinoff that we did called generational transfer entrepreneurs. We were looking at, you know, buying up small businesses and, and putting people in place, uh, to continue to grow them. So we made about four or five acquisitions while I was, while I was there. Um, this was right out of MBA school, right out of MBA school. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was really interesting too. talking about like opening up your eyes to a whole bunch of different small businesses, different sectors, different technologies, different, you know, everything from, you know, painting stuff on the roads to airline cleaning companies to healthcare to uh, that was really that was a really great part of the job. You know, I probably talked to three or four hundred CEOs that were interested in selling, um, and just just seeing what type of problems that these small business owners were getting on a daily basis um, was was just kind of eye opening to me. You know, given given what my background was. Um, and so I was, I was actually, I reached out to, uh, our former director, uh, uh, Colonel Nate Diller, Nate, Nate Diller. Um, I think within a month of when I was going to come on board, uh, the secretary of the air force started, I, I, the secretary of the air force, the, uh, Secretary of Acquisition of the Air Force, basically the guy that buys everything and the, <laughs> the secretary um, came together and they said, you know, Nate, we have this thing called AFWorks. It's doing great, great things with innovation. Um, we, I like what you're doing with this Agility Prime thing that you're that you're starting. He was coming out of the Eisenhower School, which is a very prestigious school down in, in, uh, in, in D.C. for... Uh, for military officers that they go to. So he was, that was one of his main focuses when he was coming so out of there. that's almost kind of like an executive MBA where you go back after you've been an officer. Yeah, yeah. So he was he was just coming out of that, um, spending a lot of time in, the, in, in D.C. Why Agility Prime started out, and it was, you know, hey, we, we lost the war or we lost the battle with uh, small UAS and, and drones, right? You can't find anything or you couldn't several years ago couldn't find anything that wasn't developed in China. Like they, they owned the, they owned everything. They opened, owned the development. They, you know, DJI is, is, yeah, is mo- monumental. Player. Yeah. So like, you know, when I was, when I was at Carnegie Mellon, I spent some time over in uh, the Chinese university at Hong Kong and, and that really opened my eyes. You know, we, we spent time um, at the Badu's and the Tencent's and a couple other the, of their tech companies. And I saw just the, the, the data and the technology aspect that is, you know, 
basically Chinese owned. You know, everything over there is, you know, state owned, right? It, there's a percentage. So the, I didn't realize that. So the government just subsidizes every single for profit entity in China, basically. Yes, the government owns at least a certain percentage of all of that. So if you think about it, just all the data, everything. So so you look at a 10 cent, right? And And what they showed me at the time was, can you imagine what you can do with just this, just the data set of all of your bank records, all of your healthcare, all of your Uber, all of your, like <laughs> everything was on one app, right? It was all owned by the same company. What wasn't owned by the same company, the, Ch you know, the Chinese government had access to the other party. So that, you know, they had about as a complete data set as you could possibly have. So, the, you know, what you could do now Given AI, you yeah, know, four yeah, exactly. or five, six years later, you know, it, it gets it gets really scary. And yeah, so, if you stored that data, I mean, you could train up, you know, just the craziest AI. Exactly. Um, Which I'm sure they did. I'm I'm sure they did. Like I, 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 that was the other thing. It's like, who are we kidding? They're obviously doing this, right? Yeah. And and now you 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 look at the social credit score and some of the other stuff that they're doing. Um, that is wild to me. The social credit score. It, it is. It is. It is crazy to see. But but. Obviously, with all the data, like right, you, you can train that up, and and it can it can happen. So, you know, coming back from that and seeing that when this opportunity came up to come in, and I was the uh, I was the first deputy director at AFWorks, and and working with with Nate and several of the other folks, um, the, the the small team that we put together uh, worked. I mean. As hard as any any startup that I could I could probably think yeah. of. You know, it was a startup merger per se that we did in the government, where you know Nate was coming out of school, out of the Eisenhower School with all of his back. I mean, that guy has a resume longer than, you know, for <laughs> what what one of the most incredible. <laughs> Nate was one of the most incredible folks I've ever met in my life. Just, the guy, just his work ethic and getting getting after it. Um, he was the only person that could have done the director job of bringing all this stuff together, and and they basically kind of threw all this at him and said, hey, go figure out how to make this all work. And and it was all during COVID. Um, a lot of it was during COVID. You know, the first time I really, I met a lot of the team was almost six or eight months in, into it. You know, everything was, was still very much remote. Um, and so we, you know, we developed software products that, that gave us the ability to you know, to, to rapidly go fast. Um, and that was something that whenever I came on the team, I was, I was very adamant of, you know, cause I was a former, uh, comm squadron commander. So I understood all of the, you know, communication issues that, that bases had, um, just the speed of, of doing at the speed of relevance is what I like to say. And, and we needed something at that if we were going to communicate properly with, all the small businesses, because that was a big that was a big issue of why, you know, why it, well, it, coming out of the pandemic. I mean, that's everybody was doing that. I yeah. feel like at that time because we all had to. I mean, to be able to continue to conduct business, it it, it was it, it was a it was necessary. I think at the time, and I and I think from a sense of urgency standpoint, um, I, I don't want to say that 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 we've lost a lot of that, but I I think um, having air superiority with our you know, with the past conflicts, um, you know, over Iraq and Afghanistan, like the way that we by a mile, <laughs> well, yeah, right, like, <laughs> like, uh, like, yeah, we, we've we, we've had the superiority of 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 the air and space for such a long time that you know if we get into a f you know future conflicts are going to be very different than that, and and we need to fundamentally think differently. Um, and I, I think speed is going to be the number one factor to, to do that. And so that's something we were very conscious about is, you know, how can we, you know, decrease the time it takes? How do we incentivize, you know, thinking through a different lens of, of the small business through the technology company to make them want to work with, um, want to work with the government, right? And that, that was... That was where some of our innovations came from uh, early on in the program. So what are some of the things you did in order to make um, working with the government more enticing for a small business? Well, so, so a lot of it, a lot of it was around the SBIR, um, the SBIR program. 
Uh, so small business of innovative research, um, how it used to, how it used to be. And, and we still have this, by the way, we, we have things called the specific topic and that's where a, an entity in the government, uh, has a very niche need and they want to, you know, solicit, uh, small businesses out there, technology companies to help them do some research to get to that to get to that next level, right? And so if I have a widget that I want on a on an F-16, right? Um, I post, hey, I want a widget on an F-16. It needs to be X, Y, and Z. You know, what small business out there wanna, wanna pitch us, right? And so you had a very specific problem set. Yeah. And a lot, it was, it's, I mean, we talked about this before. It's, it, it's very, it's still very hard to develop a, proposal for that right yeah well even that idea of a pitch i think is afworks unique because my understanding and i'm no expert on this is that um you know the army and the navy have you write like a multi-page you know kind of cumbersome document it has to conform to certain font and formatting requirements but that the way afworks does it is it's a it's effectively a pitch competition right so we, correct me if I'm wrong here. No, no. So actually, that that was one of the innovations. So what I was describing was was the specific aspect of, you know, here's here's the pitch that you have to do, but it has to be this very specific narrow thing that no one really knew to look there, right? I, I you know, you would talk to the majority of the companies um, before we before AFWorks started. The SBAR program has been around for thirty. 30, 50 years, I, I forget how many years, but it's been a long time. Um, and it's, it's been a great, a great way to, to kind of fund um, research, to fund small businesses. But, but it's what we saw, it was the same companies that were doing this kind of over and over again. So you had a lot of repeats because they understood the process and they understood how to do it, but we weren't getting the bleeding edge, right? The incentive structure was Hey, we're going to pay you. It's going to be on our timeline. It's going to be on a very specific way to, to go through. Um, and that's when we looked at this and we said, well, what if we, what if we don't know all the answers? Um, and so, you know, like the Jason Rathjes and the Steve Lovers of the world that were on the program with us very early on, um, you know, collectively built what's called the open topic. And that was, Hey, that, that's, let's move the requirement a little bit to the right. Let's have, you know, things that we're interested in. Right. And so you have to, you have to be in this, in this, in this ballpark. Um, but we don't have all the answers and we want whatever interesting technology is out there. Um, because we don't know if it's applicable. We, you know, we, we're not the end all be all. And I, I think that was kind of humbling for a lot of folks in the, in the government to, to be like, well, I'm a expert in X, Y, or Z, but yeah, but there's a lot going on out in the private <laughs> sector, you know, and that was something, you know, getting out and spending some time in the private sector really opened up my eyes to, to that level of understanding that, that there's a lot going on outside. It's, it's funny you should mention that. I was reading some kind of a topic, and I can't remember if it was a small business innovation research contract topic or if it was a broad agency announcement, which is for people listening, like a sort of a bigger version of that that large companies can compete on too. But, you know, it was so specific in what they wanted. It said, you know, we want to have a development spiral with spirals lasting, you know, three to five weeks. And I'm like, why are you micromanaging it that much? You know, it's like, you know, you're going to get, I mean, a very narrow subset of things that could solve your problem by dictating the way that it's done so much rather than just, you know, what you're actually looking for as an answer. Yeah, our, our, our strategy going into this was how do we, again, look at it a little bit differently. How do we make it so that we, we are attractive to those, you know, cause the, the, the great technologies that are out there, um, unless they're at a big prime, like they're rarely ever going to come pitch the government. I, I think I've talked to, I don't know how many venture capitalists and before, before the DIUs and the AFWorks of the world, um, that really have kind of spurred DIU this, this defense, defense innovation, innovation unit. Okay, yeah, unit. Sorry. D defense Innovation Unit. Um, I confused it with DAU. I DA, think. yeah. Don't don't confuse that with DAU. But uh, they're they're <laughs> they're apologies. great too. They they do a lot of uh, uh, you know a lot of uh, acquisition uh, training and stuff like that that a lot of our folks need. But Defense Acquisition University. Yeah, Defense <laughs> Acquisition. There you go. Um, but but anyway, before all that, like the 
venture capital, if they were going fast and quick and they were developing the bleeding edge tech, it was like, don't work with the government. They're just going to slow you down. And, and we, we were, right? And so we need to, <laughs> the, the government needs to think and say, if we want to be part of this, we can't slow them. We, 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 we have to try not to slow them down as much as we can. Um, and so that was imperative early on in the development of the, of the program um, and something we were concentrated on. So it was really open topic where come pitch us. It was dual use to where we don't necessarily need to be driving early on in the research. And dual use, just for people listening, and correct me if I'm wrong here, it's when something works for the military, but it also has a sales case within the private sector. Correct, yeah. It, it, too, too often we would see all the research being developed, and then we had this thing called the Valley of Death, which we refer to all the time, and it's where it doesn't align with the acquisition cycle, which is how we buy stuff in the government. And so there's a lot of things that have to align, and if they don't align and you have all your eggs in the government basket, then there's nothing You're screwed. left. Your company goes out of business. Exactly. There's nothing left for you. And so we actually, uh, I, I believe this is true, um, but don't quote me on it, but the, the technology in the majority of the Chinese uh, surveillance systems, although there's a certain lens technology that I believe was developed under a some sort of SBIR through like North Carolina or something. And then it sat on a shelf and some Chinese company came and bought it. And then that's what they're, that's what they're doing now. That's so wild. so that, that's an example of like what we don't want to happen. So, so how do you, how do you combat that? Right. And it's, it's make sure that we're not the only player in town that someone else is interested. Um, someone else is interested in this, in this technology that the business, which again, the government, we don't know how to, evaluate businesses. Yeah, I would imagine sifting through, you know, even a thousand applications would just be arduous and almost like a needle in a haystack type exercise. Um, what are some of the ways that you're able to, you know, sort of delegate that workload and, and kind of find the diamonds in the rough? Yeah, so it's a, it's, <laughs> it's a good question. I, a, a lot of it is, we have crowdsource evaluators that come in, uh, a lot of it was working with the the research lab, which we're, we're technically under as well. So getting that technical expertise to come evaluate them. So we evaluate them, um, you know, technically, militarily, and commercially. And so we have we have those kind of three evaluation aspects. Makes sense. And they all get you know. Is they, it feasible? Does it help the military? Is it saleable? Yeah, yeah. So so we we they get evaluated, um, and then they basically you know we bring in a whole lot of people to come help for each one of these solicitations. So it'll be, you know, a two week period, three week period where they're coming in and they're, you know, doing all the evaluations. Um, it's done collectively several times where your, your proposal will be evaluated, you know, several, several times by different people. Um, and then basically it gets a number assigned to it. It gets racked and stacked and then based off of the funding that we have that round, we just kind of go down and what gets funded gets funded. So that's awesome. Yeah. So it's an exercise in prioritization basically. And, Pre pretty, and pretty much. And, and, and so, you know, it's, it's, we're continuing to work on our evaluation process because it, it, you know, it, how that prioritization stand is going to be different based off of who you talk to, it makes you know, sense. right. So you're not going to get, the winners from, you know, from the, you know, this general wants X, Y, and Z. Okay. Well, trying to, trying to navigate that political, uh, spectrum is also not the easiest. So, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to develop as, as, as fair and impartial process that we can, but, but again, keeping that speed as a factor, right? We, we can't, you know, we, we've, we've decreased the time to award from like over 200 days down to I think we're sub ninety now. Awesome from uh, from that standpoint. So so again, looking at it through the eyes of the business, uh, through the eyes of like if we're going to continue to stay relevant, what are the things that we need to do? Because a lot can happen in two hundred days. I mean, you could lose your whole team exactly you know, just to attrition and, and other work. Yeah, yeah, and you know a lot of these are. You know, you, you know how intense it is to to develop, uh, you know, just the proposal, right? I mean, you're talking several tens, or if not a hundred plus hours of 
of putting some of these proposals together. You know, some sometimes it's all right. We're going to create a separate business unit that's just going to go after um, after the defense aspect. It of makes this, sense to of me. This stuff, right? Well, it seems like the requirements for defense are different than the requirements for doing well in the private sector too. So, you optimize for different things. I mean, you don't really need a contracts administrator to go after private sector contracts. You can't really do defense work without one. And so, just for instance. Um, you know, when we talked, I think we talked billets earlier and what a billet is. A billet is a, a full-time funded position that you get. And so when we, when we came from headquarters, we had, I think it was six full-time billet positions. So like we, we started out with, with, with six. I, I think we're going to end up probably between, probably, I think we're, yeah, probably between 250 and 300 um, at full, full end strength for, you know, we, we've, we've brought on a couple of different initiatives that we're doing. We have a, um, we have a capital, uh, insights division now that is also looking at due diligence and looking at adversarial capital and different things there. Um, like I said, we what have is adversarial capital in this context. Uh, I mean, looking at Chinese investment gotcha, yeah, or, f- you know, foreign investment coming into a lot of these companies, foreign ownership, foreign influence, um, so we, 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 we do look at all of that because they're going to be counterbidding on some of this technology. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Like, uh, I'm, we, yeah, I, it, if there's, sense. if there's good technology out there, like it's a, it's a free market. Right. And yep. unfortunately we can't play in their market, but they, they play in ours. So it's, it, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> we're fighting with our hand behind our back, but, um, that's how free markets work. So. Yeah, yeah so. that's that's awesome. That's quite a journey. <laughs> it it it's been it's been quite a journey. So, um, looking looking back and looking through all of it and the development that we've done, there's still a lot of work to do. I mean, early on in the program, we we had all kinds of restrictions, all kinds of cultural issues from from going from, you know, the 1.0 crowd that was very kind of fast and loose is a bad word, but you know they were going fast and they were at the headquarter level. And how do we take this 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 great innovative mindset and 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 make it so that it becomes a technology transfer organization, right? And so there's a little bit of you know there's this cultural shift as we were going into the research lab, um, because that that's where all the you know that was where all the technical technical expertise was, and so the integration was was I always say that that that's its own Harvard case study that I should probably write someday. Um, from an organizational change management standpoint, um, we, we, we did it. Uh, we got through it with a, a lot of scars, but um, it, awesome. it was how do, we, how, do we, how do we get the types of people that we need on the team? Um, and so we had to come up, I, I, had to, I had to relearn how to do government hiring and, and relearn all this other stuff as the, as the deputy because that was it. We didn't have a, IT, you know, we, we didn't have a chief technology officer, so I was like wearing that hat. You know, I was, I was so the, the deputy director is like the chief operating officer. It sounds like pretty much, yeah. Okay, it almost, I mean, just to not to harp on the cat analogy, but it sounds like you're herding cats in a sense. Like there was you know. there was a lot of herding cats. I mean, that yeah. that has long been a Air Force, uh, as long as I can remember the, uh, I what well, there was like a what was the commercial. With the, it, it was the herding cat commercial. I mean, that that analogy has been used throughout my career um, several times. Of Mine too. The herding cats. Yes. The. Do you remember what that was? That a Bud Light commercial or something? Or I don't think I saw that one. But I'm, I'm not watching a whole lot of TV. Uh, this was this was this was well over a decade ago. But it was. I'm picturing a Super Bowl commercial for some it, reason. It may have been a Super Bowl commercial where it was guys in uh, guys with the lassos on horseback. <laughs> and it was just little kittens <laughs> running through every, I mean, that was, that's pretty funny. That, that was, that was what we were doing. So yeah. at the time it was, it was, it was whatever I needed to be. Now, I, I remember Nate called me one time. He's like, Hey Phil, I, I have to, I, I, I'm getting called to the Pentagon. Like, I, I need you to take this. <laughs> I need you to take this call for me. I'm like, oh, okay, what, what, what's the call about? I'm like, he's like, just, just tell someone about Afworks. I'm like, okay. So I, at the time I was like, oh, what am I getting myself? So I, I, go in it's just a virtual meeting but there's like you know i think there was like 400 people on the other line it was like all the it was like all these other people together and they wanted it i was just like that's that's the type of stuff that we just got thrown into 
Um, because four hundred person conference <laughs> yeah. call, it was like, oh, there's a four hundred person conference call. There you go, Phil. Um, How is that not a presentation at that point? Like, <laughs> well, it, it, oh, it, you should see. I mean, just I, I look back now, and I, I, I look at I, I found our original slide deck that looks like, you know, my nephew <laughs> who's five could have like crayon something as good as where we were. But I mean, we were going with it, and it was just however we needed to get the job done. Yeah. Um, it, we would. We, we, it, Better than it was not having a slide deck. It was, <laughs> it, it was, it was like I said. It was, a, it was a great team with a lot of heroic efforts to get it, um, to get it where it's at. And there's, there's numerous people that that deserve uh, a lot of credit in in making it to where we are today. Awesome. There was there was a parking lot at SpaceX where we must have had like a several hundred cat population, like just feral. <laughs> <laughs> We, wild. we had the same thing. I remember at, at Edwards Air Force Base, we were out there, and uh, I, I think they, they did something to the coyote population one year. Cause oh, were, that's interesting. Yeah, they were, they were keeping the other population in check. Yeah, so, so they, they – they, I don't know if they killed a bunch of the uh, – anyway, I relocated or killed, whatever. So anyway, there weren't <laughs> a lot of coyotes the one year, and, and we had rabbits. And I just remember driving on base and there were dead rabbits on the road everywhere. You would go, we had these, because it was out in the middle of the desert, right? So there wasn't know, coyotes that were killing them. It wasn't coyotes. And there were, there were rabbits everywhere at night. You would drive through and there would be like little areas of grass. Cause again, we were in the desert and you would, your lights would go and you would see like hundreds of little beady eyes all over the, with so many, and then the next, I think the next year, you just saw some, you know, normally coyotes are a little wiry and, and they were well-fed coyotes. And I think they, they fixed the uh, equilibrium of the population. <laughs> but uh, man, I remember that was, that was, that was pretty crazy. That's wild. Yeah. There was a lot of, a lot of fun times, yeah. even, even back in, in flight tests. I know we talked about the, uh, um, the the snack the snack stuff and yep. and the uh, <laughs> the heritage room that we that we had with uh, with different things there that was a lot of that was a lot of fun as well. But what is a heritage room? Just for background, uh, heritage room is like uh, an excuse to have a bar at a at a squadron. Gotcha. <laughs> um, so it, it's uh, you know Friday beer beer thirty come comes around everyone goes to the heritage bar and uh, you know we would have namings there where. You know, you would get your call sign. Uh, so oh, that's the awesome. pilots and uh, pilots and all that stuff would be there, and there'd be a lot. Of, you know, usually a lot of a lot of drinking. And then I, I we talked about the uh, um, would make jalapeno popcorn, which was a big thing, um, or you'd have the actual pop big popcorn maker, and you you know throw the oil and the jalapenos up top, and it would make the popcorn really spicy. So oh, you're like, doing this with fresh jalapenos. Oh, fresh. Yeah. Well, pickled, usually pickled jalapenos, but yeah, it still sounds awesome. It, I it was, was picturing like jalapeno salt. With no, 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 no. This was, this was a, and you couldn't, you couldn't mess it up as a, as a Lieutenant or you'd be just hazed. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe I shouldn't say hazed, but you would be, uh, yeah, it, it would be, it would be good. Um, so yeah, there was all kinds of stuff that, that happened, but, it was it was to keep. I mean, that's where you you know you, you met everyone. You got to you got to know people. Um, I think those things are important. A lot of a lot of it, you know. It's uh, so. Then when I went to my next my next unit, um, it was early, early in the F thirty five days, and uh, we were just we were building everything at the time, and I noticed that we didn't have a uh, a popcorn machine. So I, I just went and <laughs> bought one, and then I I lugged it up to. Uh, to the location that we were That's put awesome. it in there and, and we were making jalapeno popcorn from, nice. from then on. It was Carl, it was pull good. up a picture of jalapeno popcorn. Jalapeno popcorn <laughs> is, is outstanding. It's, it's really good. It goes, goes well with, never mind the F 35 <laughs> <laughs> goes well with, with, uh, all types of beverages. You know, I, I guess the, the Afros 3.0 standpoint of, of, of aligning all of this and professionalizing the process so that it, you know, from, from inception to, you know, the end state is, is how do we bring in those, those end users, the customers, because we really operate more as, as the VC, right? We, we make the connections, we make the funding and, you know, we do some evaluation, but really, 
you need an end user that's going to buy this stuff. Otherwise, what are you doing? Exactly. Yeah. You, you need an end user that, that buys this stuff, um, whatever the technology is. You need an end user that's going to buy it after all, all of our cyber money, you know, dries up. So bringing them in or, you know, re-energizing re some of the, you know, specific topic stuff that I talked about earlier, making that, you know, a more refined process, bringing in the, you know, the, pro, uh, the, the program offices earlier um, and, and just expanding the timeline. Uh, there's different things that we've done with uh, our TACFI and STRATFI. Um, which what are, are TACFI and STRATFI? Yeah, TACFI and STRATFI is we have the, the additional funds from the SBAR. We have the additional funds that are coming in from your end customer. And we must have private match funding. Okay. So, I mean, I, I guess, as you said, like that's a family office, a venture capitalist could be private equity, but at this phase, probably could, not. Pr pr probably not. Could be, uh, it could be, you know, there's a certain time frame of when that funding had to come in as well. Um, but it's really, we want to see that there's buy-in of people looking at the company differently than we are. So it's just a way of getting market validation yes. uh, for the, okay, that makes sense. That's, I mean, that's a great way to put it, right? Cause we're, we're looking at the technology, not necessarily looking at the longevity of a business. We're not looking at, you know, the, the hiring aspects of different things. We're not looking at how healthy, you know, a lot of things that, that, uh, you know, that, VCs are, are looking at that's all they're looking at. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like that's, that's what they're looking at. We're looking at the technology and how we can incorporate it into our, into our, into our system. Do you find like the networking aspect of what you're doing sort of feeds like people that are at the companies that don't make it into the winning companies? Like, I mean, these people get to know each other. There must be some amalgamation of resources as people kind of come through your program. It, so, so that's an interesting point. And that's another reason why, um, the, 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 the personal part of it, you know, so, so we have hubs, right? We, we, we're not on any, we're a hundred percent remote organization. So, so that's weird for the government, right? So, <laughs> so we're, we're a hundred percent remote. Um, but we've developed these things called, you know, we call them innovation hubs. Um, and, and the reason we have that is so that we get outside of the fence, we get outside of the base and we're, you know, people can come talk to us right and come come ask us and pitch us their technology and, and we can we can try to point them in the right direction we can tell them about the super process we can we can get them in, in involved the importance of having that physical location I, you know i i've seen so many companies that have that i've talked to that have amazing technologies that would not have even known about AFWorks, known about the super program, known that it's changed in the, in the light of, you know, now venture capital is starting to look at this, um, as, as an, as an opportunity to, uh, to do that. I mean, very early on, we had a, a company called Icon. Uh, so they do 3d printing of, uh, of, uh, of homes, cool. um, down in, down in Austin, Texas. So they were on, they were on 60 minutes. I think I remember, I remember very early on going down and, and they had a cyber phase one with us. There were like 25 people at the time, several years ago. Um, and they were concentrating, I believe they were concentrating on, um, like affordable housing and development of, 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 of housing with their 3d printing concrete technology. But they were also looking, you know, they had some guys from MIT. I remember going through, you know, how do we develop the concrete to make sure that it's, you know, interesting or, or, you know, it can absorb all kinds of different things. So it was a chemistry company. It was this robotic, you know, 3D printing. So, you know, they got a um, phase one. They, they got a phase two. I think they got a, a TACFI, STRATFI. Uh, they're, they're building some of the stuff down at our, our base down at Tyndall. Um, we, we introduced them to the, Air Na or the Army National Guard down in Texas. They went and they built, I think it was the largest 3D printing building at the time. Um, That's cool. It was an army barracks, you know, so, so they, they and now they're several hundred people company. They have uh, contracts with NASA to develop technology to 3D print lunar material to like oh, send cool. this stuff to the moon. So, I mean, it, it, it's, 
and, that and part that, of the lift initiative or, huh is that part of the lift mission that nasa's i'm i'm not sure exactly oh, which sorry. which one that it 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 was with but i mean that started with a conversation of them walking into our austin afworks hub and sitting down and just just talking and 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 those conversations are you know i i can go example after example of the importance of that um more more so i think early on in the program just to get that i mean now we have thousands of applications that are coming in from a technology perspective like people are starting to understand and realize and and that's great to see um and that's part of our 3.0 initiative is okay now that we have all the amazon boxes coming in the door um how do we make sure that they get to the right to the right people to the right locations and so yeah. we're, we're developing continue to develop that process um and again like i said professionalizing it okay so it's basically just attaching more structure and trying to make it more sustainable by attaching like a healthier work culture and then putting that imperative back down to people yes yes I, I, healthier work culture is definitely um definitely something i mean we're not pulling the crazy hours that we were um before i mean everyone's still working very hard but um at, at the same time we've right sized as much as we could our our workforce to where you know now we have an operational uh, an operations division uh that is doing an amazing job incorporating everything from our IT infrastructure to you know different security aspects to HR to um you know everything across the board from our operation aspect where you know that was like three people before right and we were how many people is it now um our operation division is probably between 30 and 40 oh, wow. i would yeah, say now so, so yeah i mean it, it it's like an order of magnitude and it, oh yeah d definitely order of magnitude. i mean i i did a lot of our operations like when we first started with um you know as deputy that was just something that we you know, what did we need to get to the next day? I mean, it was really a lot of the, you know, I don't know how many times AFWorks could have failed. Um, you know, we, from a political standpoint, there are a lot of people that were like, why do we need, why do we need this? Um, and so that was another thing was just proving out, proving outright that, you know, this is why we need this because the, the development of technology in the private sector is now at the level, if not surpassing a lot of what we can do inside the government, just because of the constraints and how long it takes for us to procure things anymore. I, I think it's just, it's communicating properly with the, the bureaucracy, right? Um, you know, we talked earlier about the, you know, the uh, crossing the street example, right? And it, it's just, <laughs> It's it's making sure. It might that, be good to reiterate it, just because yeah, I don't think we talked about that yeah, line. So. I, a lot of the fighting bureaucracy that I've that I attribute it to is, uh, or that, that's feel that it's felt like over the last two years uh, or three years now, um, was you're at, you're at the you're at a a street and you want to cross a street, and you're standing next to, you know, we'll just say a bureaucrat at this at this point in in, in the game. Um, and you're like, I, I need to get across the street. And, they, you know, instead of just saying whatever, they just tell you, no, you can't. You're going to, you know, you'll get arrested for jaywalking or wh <laughs> whatever. Like there's there's an officer, like they're just going to arrest you. But, you know, wh what they really need to be saying, and this is part of the communication, the understanding of everyone's roles and responsibilities is, is if they would have just told you that six feet to your left, there's a crosswalk, right? <laughs> you, you push, you push the button and the little light guy, the little runny man, you know, like says something and, or, you know, then you get the beeps and then you can cross. Right. <laughs> or, or if, if that, if that, you know, if that isn't the case, like what else can we do? And it's sitting down, it's sitting down with these folks is, is what I've found to really communicate that we're all on the same team here. Like the threat is not, me going fast and trying to get across the street, you know, we need to take look at the bigger picture here. The threat is not here. The threat is elsewhere. Um, it's the technology and the financial, you know, war that we're at currently. Um, and again, it's, it's the education piece. It's the giving the examples piece. That's really important um, of, of the why behind it. Um, and even what's going on in Ukraine 
right now where they're rapidly developing. I, I just saw a, a tweet, I think, where they showed a, you know, several hundred thousand dollar or million dollar Russian tank. And it was a $500. It said the post said it was a $500, like little drone that just like went right at it and completely destroyed the, just in the hatch, I'm guessing. Yeah. Well, it went down. It must hit. It must, it, they knew exactly where to hit it and it hit the gas tank, I guess. And the whole thing just like disintegrated. That's why it was, it was. And, and I mean, that's why we need to think differently about everything that we're doing for the, you know, the next conflict or, you know, if we want to stay relevant, if we, we need, if we want to stay on top in any form or fashion, um, because everything's changing. The only constant is change. And if we don't do that at the speed of relevance, like we're, we're, we're doomed. I kind of like that at the speed of relevance bit to it. <laughs> well, that, it, that's, that's what I've always kind of, been pushing because yeah, we, we need to go fast. We want to go fast. Um, but if we don't go fast and it, if it's not at the speed that is relevant enough, we need to think up a different way to do it or we need to think up something else. I remember just starting out in pit in Pittsburgh, you know, we went down, I saw the Austin hub and I was like, we saw how it was a cross flow of venture capital is a cross flow of, different technology you have you know ut austin is is right there um, oh that anahis gymnasium is awesome for robotics <laughs> mitch Pryor. <laughs> yes uh, so i mean a great ecosystem that's all right there kind of at, at your fingertips that's where we want to be um and so coming coming back being in pittsburgh i i can say the same thing looking around here um maybe we're not at the scale that, that Austin is, but I think from a value standpoint, um, with CMU for, you know, everything, computer science, robotics, with the startup ecosystem here, with some of the major corporations that are here with, you know, UPMC, um, with, you know, with Pitt and, and some of the healthcare, uh, stuff that's coming out of there, um, you know, Pitt has a great international space program that they're, you know, they're working with us on a couple of things. So it, it's, well, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. They're ge- uh, geopolitics in space. Uh, they're actually doing a, a project with us, um, now as well. So, it, but, and then space, just, just understanding, um, you know, the, the economy of space and, and how that is, is, is going with, with companies, you know, like Astrobotic that are here. And, and that was, um, that was one thing that really kind of pushed it. You know, I started the hub. We were, we were at CMU, um, at the Swartz center. I was right next to Dave Moyni's office. Um, I just saw him in Vegas at CES. Oh, he was just there. Oh, uh, at the, the shift robotics booth. Oh, that's yeah. I remember when he st- spotted me. He can I, I was kind of going over sheepishly, just to say hi or get a picture with it. And he's like, "Spence, how you doing?" Oh, that's so. that's great. Uh, Dave, Dave is outstanding. He's a solid dude. Dave is outstanding. He's so. We, we, I remember when Chef Robotics was. I forget what their first name was, but I remember uh, we were we were doing. I'm trying to remember too. It's I'm blanking it, on it as well. He was he was spinning around the Schwartz Center. Like on those shoes, on those shoes, <laughs> when they you know, first developed, this was five. This He's was like f- the chairman of the board now. Was he still doing that then? I, well, not not Dave wasn't the one, but the uh, whoever their CEO is, uh, Shunzi. Shunzi, yeah. He, so he was he was spinning around the office when he was just first designing the shoes. I, I remember that. I was like, what What is this guy doing? And th- yeah, now he has a company at CES. Like they're doing really, really great, really, really great things. Um, with that. And I mean, it, it was just really interesting to see things like that co- go to fruition and, and, you know, become big companies and they are not, you know, they're now they're selling at CES. Right. Um, so, so we started out, you know, just a very small location there, um, at, at CMU and then 
and, and the whole point was so that we'd be somewhere where we could intersect with, um, with the small businesses where people could just come in and have conversations. And we were with, um, it was, it was Faraday labs or something came in one day. Um, and they, they did a corrosion resistant, they had a corrosion resistant technology that, that helped. And so Dave just came into the, he literally was like, Hey, I have this company here. You know, can you just sit down and, and listen to them and, and see if they would be, you know, a cyber uh, uh, candidate or something, or if, if they're interesting. And then, yeah, we sat down and we're like, Oh, well actually, you know, the, the one seventy first and the nine eleventh that's here local in Pittsburgh, like they had some corrosion issues with something and they would love to, you know, to, to work with you. Um, and so they put in for a Cibber and they got a direct, I think they got a direct to phase two. So like a, you know, $1.2 million grant that came in and it was all happenstance because we had the location. Dave was able to come and get an AFWorks person and just kind of sit down and talk with the folks. So, I mean, that was early on in the program, but really what, um, really what, what kind of supercharged, I guess the rest of it was, um, I, you know, we were building out use cases. We were building out, um, what, what we needed here in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, I, I talked with, uh, at the time I just talked with, uh, a couple of folks from CMU. Um, I talked to Dave Mawinney. Um, Good dude. great dude. Uh, love you, Dave. Um, Dave, <laughs> he's uh yeah he was outstanding. So you must know Craig then too. I know Craig. Craig's yeah. awesome as well. It, he's done the podcast as well. Oh, they, they were, I'm, I gotta I'm get in, Dave on. I'm I, a, you gotta get Dave. On. I'm yeah. I'm in I'm in great company. Then this is this is outstanding. But it, so you know, CMU was 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 great in uh, in in really in initial partnerships of how we can how we can start things out. Um, and and really what supercharged this was uh, meeting with uh, Justine Kashnitsa. And uh, the work that she's done with the Keystone Space Collaborative here in uh, here in Pittsburgh, um, which has been incredible, and and Keystone has been an incredible partner as we've been able to continue to develop our location here in Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, we were able to launch back in uh, December of 2022 with uh, General Thompson, who's the uh, number two for the space force. Cool. And he just, he, he just continued to communicate his excitement. Um, yeah. and I, I want that to continue. We, we developed that, um, the innovation district, uh, with, with Keystone and, and Justine, you know, has done a lot of work, uh, with the city to make sure that that can be, um, something that's ongoing. And we just continue to, uh, be excited about what's to come in the, uh, in the coming years. Cool. I mean, that's, that's a beautiful, uh, sentiment. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, that seems like a good note to end on. Uh, is there anything you want to plug on the way out? Um, oh, if you've had a positive experience with us, we would love, we would love to put something together. If anyone, and if anyone has anything bad to say, um, email Jordan. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> well, how can you get a hold? Of Jordan? <laughs> how can you get hold of Jordan? Uh, yeah, we'll we'll put Jordan's picture, or LinkedIn, and all that, all that stuff right here, and he can. No, but no, really. It, Carl, it, let it in Jordan's contact. Information. <laughs> all, of, all of Jordan's contact information. No, it, <laughs> but, but we we want to hear that too, right? As much as. It, 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 we don't have all the answers and, and we don't want to sit back and, and say that we do because we're, we're just, that'd be just ignorant. So um, we, we, we're trying to continue to make this a, a avenue to bring in commercial tech and to provide, you know, for the, you know, for the taxpayer and for the government to sustain our uh, the technological power. So. Hey, it's good to see our tax dollars actually going to something worthwhile. There you go. That's the, we're we're trying to keep those those good success stories coming. So, uh, what's the best way to get a hold of you for that? Uh, you can put my contact information um, up. It's uh, you know f- uh, Phil Hahn at afwerks.af. Uh, you know, feel free to feel free to reach out and and let me know. Uh, again, if it's bad, uh, email Jordan. But uh, what is that Jordan dot Smith Jordan dot Smith at Yeah, there you, there you go. So, um, 
but no, I mean, thank you for what you're doing. You're I, I have all, I have all the, the, the thanks and gratitude for, uh, you know, for, for the ability to do what I'm doing and, and hopefully being able to make some, some real change, um, in, into what I've seen is, you know, one of the greatest threats that we have against us. And it's going to take, it's going to take the entirety of the, you know, the U S industrial base. It's going to take all the small businesses for us to stay on top. Um, and I, I, I'm going to continue to, to fight the good fight hopefully. So, uh, you know, please continue to submit and let us know how we can do better at, uh, at AFWorks. Yeah. Happy to get involved. And, uh, thank you for coming on, Phil. Yeah. Really enjoyed this. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us today. If you've made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at www.ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.